Okay. Uh, I think that's everything. Um, okay. Listen, everybody, thank you for joining us uh, today. Hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully you can see me um, as well. Um, I am Matthew Norton, and I'm the founder of Mamusi Foundation, a charity that's been working for uh, 17 years now in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, thank you for coming along. You will have seen me posting probably on LinkedIn or Twitter um, or Facebook for, for some time now about the innovation in classroom design that, that, that we've been doing now for the last year. Um, so really excited to be able to share the thinking and theory behind that. I'm joined by two people as well today. I'm joined by Hannah Wood, um, who was the architect who's worked with me on this. Unfortunately, her colleague, uh, Katerina, is unwell, um, but would have been here as well. So unfortunately, it, 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 um, Katerina's not here, but we do have Hannah. Um, and we've also got uh, Peter as well on the line. Peter is the builder one of the builders that we've been working with in Magadi in Kenya um, for on the construction work that, that, that we've been doing. Um, Hannah, do you want to introduce yourself um, and then we'll let Peter do it and then we'll talk more about this concept. Yeah, um, hi everyone. So my name is Hannah Woods, as Matthew just introduced me there. Um, I'm an architect. I am um, trained in the UK and in Denmark, and I have worked um, predominantly in my career in, in East Africa, um, in Tanzania, and now I'm, yeah, I'm calling in from Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, yes. Thank you for joining us. Peter, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Peter Gurmak. I uh, you know some of you are wondering why my name is Peter and I'm wearing a turban. <laughs> <laughs> uh, professionally, I'm an architect as well, but I've been working uh, in construction for the past eight years now. Uh, I'm born and raised in Kenya and I've been uh, working in Magadi for the past eight years with uh, my dad. And uh, we are partners with Memosi Foundation for a while now. And it's, it's, a, it's been an amazing journey. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Right. Let's, let's get to it. Let's get to the detail of what we are doing at Memosi Foundation, why we're doing it. Um, let me be really clear at the outset. Um, our ideas here are to be shared, are to collaborate, are to just let people know about what we're doing. Um, we're not seeking anything else. This is simply to try and share good practice, share the learnings that we've got in the hope that, do you know what, it inspires other people that you want to get on board, that you want to hear more about it, and maybe even collaborate with Hannah and take the designs and go and make this difference yourself, because this is hopefully far bigger than myself uh, or anything that we're doing it's, it's about helping people as well so as i said i work in kenya um, and tanzania the role of mamusi foundation is to support children um, who otherwise would not be in school to get access to education um, that's what we did for 10 or 11 years and then evolved our strategy as well to start looking more at the wider interventions in education and working collaboratively with other schools and government schools, looking at what the biggest interventions in education were. So things such as healthcare, food, teacher and teacher development, all of those things that make a school outside a building are the areas that we've been looking at. And that led me to a situation which was an understanding that a huge amount of people focus on construction and infrastructure that's where a huge amount of investment is and um, very aware that that limits some of the other spend that is possible in education and I'm going to come back to that and I'll come back to the research around that um, further on in the call but I, I decided that I wanted to set a challenge for Hannah as an architect a friend of mine um, now the challenge was this I would like a classroom 
where we have the cost of construction. I don't want to compromise on dimensions. So I need the same floor space because clearly it would be easy to simply design a classroom where we have the floor space and therefore you have in the cost. I wanted to do something very different. Community involvement was really important and using local people, working with local people as well. That was as far as the brief went. I can't honestly say at the outset that I necessarily expected that Hannah would be able to exactly have the cost of construction, but it certainly was an ambition that I set her in the hope that we would drastically reduce the overall cost of construction um, so that more could be achieved in the education space. Um, Hannah, I'm going to hand over to you to pick up from this point. Everybody's here to hear more about these classrooms and how you've designed them and why you've designed them in the way that you have. So over to you. Let me know if you're going to share photographs or you want me to do so. Could, could you, um, could I share my screen? I think you've just got to give me a permission there. Um, right. Uh, okay, let me figure out how to do that. No worries. Um, but yeah, I, so so what I can do today is talk talk everyone through the kind of um, some of the problems um, that Matt kind of set us as architects and designers to look into um, how we approached it. There's some types of principles that we um, were trying to integrate into the design and how we sort of got from the brief to to preparing a, a, a design for a new classroom. So, so to give a bit more background on, on um, the work that I do and I'm really interested in. So I've been working in the kind of architectural research and prototyping for um, many years now. And as an architect, I'm really interested in sort of low tech solutions, things that kind of, um, you know, work with the local climate um, that think about passive design and that are also kind of um, solve some key challenges that we we face. So let me see if I can do perfect. Yeah, I got it here. So so here we are um, as a kind of uh, let me just get this full screen. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's being a little slow. Um, so, so the kind of way that um, at least I start to think about um, projects is always starting with the um, starting with the site. So, thinking about design that's very site specific that you kind of draw from not only the kind of um, climate and materials that you find on site, but also local knowledge and, and ways of doing things. And that's kind of interesting when you think about sort of innovative projects. So, um, so okay, but back in 2017 and 18, um, I was uh, about to move to Tanzania. Um, 2018, I was living in Tanzania and um, was really interested in, in the potential of kind of passive cooling in design and, and also the difference between uh, you know, very hot tropical climates and um, and hot arid climates and how to build uh, effectively to kind of cool temperatures inside without uh, mechanical cooling. Oh. Okay, so so Matt, Matt comes to us and says, okay, can you, can you design a classroom with half the cost? And we say, oh, okay, that, that's, that's quite ambitious. So, so we started off with saying, okay, what is the kind of biggest weight that you have in a classroom? What is the kind of biggest spend often? And in any build, often it's your foundations and your roof. Okay, can we do something that's, uh, you know, that we keep the footprint small, we use, we use materials that are kind of already on the market, um, but how can we actually save cost in the walls of the classroom? And we looked into some different ideas. Um, I have a very good friend that's, um, uh, working with Rammed Earth and kind of involved in, in the early stages of that project, thought that could be an option. We also looked at compressed earth blocks. I think that's really interesting, sort of dependent on your soil. Perforated concrete blocks as well, like saving on your concrete and um, volume of concrete in your, in your block work. But I think something that we were really interested from the outset was this idea of, um, yeah, the, the potential of Gabion walls. So, 
you know, we were looking for materials that were enduring, which were affordable, which were low tech to a certain degree. Um, maybe it was a farm work structure and then you actually add um, rocks in low maintenance and sensitive to local landscape, which is where this kind of Gaubian walls thing came from because Katerina was living in Kenya, I think in 2015 it was, um, and she had actually been to the Magadi region before and she just remembered it kind of, and that, that first photo is one that she took and, you know, she just remembered this kind of arid rocky landscape and that's kind of in our collaboration where we first started talking about potential of rocks and okay, that's something freely available on the site. Can we actually apply it? Can we use it in the design? Um, so then we started looking in a bit more detail, like can this be done? How are the joints working? How are the kind of, um, how is the structure working? What sort of sizes do you need to actually do this? And I think it's kind of an interesting process for me to actually start with the material and then kind of work it up. That's um, not, not a strategy I've really used before, but because of the kind of cost implications, it was really important to actually ensure this could be built from the outset. Um, so this is a kind of sketch which I dug out. And I think from the first meeting we sort of had with Matt, it's like, you know, the, the, you, you have this kind of terrain, this brown layer, something that could be, um, uh, you know, it, it could take many forms. You have a kind of structure. Um, and because we're working in a really rural environment, you know, you really have to minimize the stuff that's kind of, um, and Peter, I'm sure will, will tell you that it's like you really kind of um, spend a lot of money actually transporting materials. And so to actually minimize the weight and the cost of materials coming to the site and then also using, um, you know, kind of, um, for example, corrugated sheets, materials kind of in wide circulation in Kenya. Um, so that was a kind of early sketch. Um, I'm sorry, this is a little blurry, but, but essentially, um, you know, some, some kind of early concepts as well was this idea of cross ventilation um, to ensure that the classroom uh, safe. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you seeing another slide? Because we're still on slide one here. Are you? Oh dear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been moving them. Um, let me try sharing again. Okay. Um, do you see that? There you go, that's better. Yeah, we can see okay. that. Okay, so, so I, I kind of started here and then yeah. I talked a little bit about materials. Yeah. yeah. And then I went on to Gabion walls and the detailing. Yeah. An early, early sketch. Um, Excuse me, Hannah, can I ask, since we didn't get to see those as you were speaking, because I am yeah. very interested in, in yeah. seeing. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I can just talk a little bit more about this. I mean, it was a very early sketch kind of concept of, you know, you have um, a frame structure um, as a, um, a kind of element, which we then fill with, with local rocks um, from the area, the kind of Gabion wall. And then that would be supporting a kind of lightweight um, corrugated roof with an air gap. Um, so all this is designed around these concepts of of passive cooling, which I'm really interested in, um, especially when we're kind of talking about this very rural area. And yes, okay, we've got we've got solar power and the potential for for rainwater capture to a certain extent, but really you want to be kind of ensuring that you know in your maintenance of the building, you you keep it as sort of easy <laughs> as possible. And yeah, um, and using the kind of elements and and um, you know, predominant wind direction and these types of things as a as a starting point. So, so thinking about this idea of uh, cross ventilation. So having your windows are kind of opposite each other to guide the air through, um, uh, because you you know the, the temperatures are really it gets really really hot even in the shade. Um, and here we've I've also kind of got this thermal mass. Um, so something that actually warms up uh, during the day and actually expels heat at night, which is sort of perfect for a classroom use because it then, you know, in the, when it's kind of got predominant use, your inside is cooler. And then during the night, it kind of um, 
expels that heat, which, you know, if this was a bedroom, you might kind of think the other way around in a sense, like it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. And I've worked with housing in Tanzania and that's often, you know, in tropical climates is how do you keep the mass as, as lightweight as possible. But here in this arid climate, we're thinking about thermal mass and also like how do you shade key areas? So here we've got the roof actually extending over um, an outdoor space. Um, because then, you know, kids are not sat down in the classroom all the time. Maybe they're waiting to go into their lesson. Um, and the idea with these classrooms is that you could then build them in a modular way. So that creates a kind of sort of entry point, um, which I can show in some of the renders, um, which is shaded. Um, so these were some kind of early sketches looking at sort of orientation and looking at you know, where you could have the shaded area, how you could actually form these, um, you know, we, we were trying to figure out, yes, it needs to be modular, but it doesn't need to be rectangular. Actually, we ended up rectangular because it, it, made, most, <laughs> it made most sense in terms of constructing this type of um, uh, gabion wall. And so this is another kind of early sketch looking at, um, you can see here, we're thinking about where is the, the sun coming from? What's the predominant wind direction? This idea of cross ventilation, um, maybe also building in to the, the structure of the classroom, some storage we were thinking, um, and also having this kind of relationship between the outdoor space, which in Kenya is often a courtyard, um, and the classroom itself. Can you create those kind of like natural uh, shaded areas? Katrina, I think in 2014, she was also looking at this idea of rewilding in Kenya, um, how to how to kind of um, you know add add new sort of vegetation and, and uh, native trees. So I think we were talking a lot about a bit. But we were talking a lot about um, the potential for kind of natural tree shading as well. Um, also, if anyone's got any questions, you're welcome to jump in and and uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> Um, yeah, otherwise I'll, I'll just keep keep going, but, but please feel free. Um, so, so as we're developing the design, again, we're kind of coming back to thinking about buildability. I think um, it was kind of important and, and also from, from experience, um, you know, actually thinking about the steps of construction, however they might take place, um, would really help actually kind of guide some design decisions as well. And um, so this is kind of this study. So, so it, it started to become, you know, these two roofs that were working together, um, a roof over the main classroom, and then a roof over the, um, the kind of walkway, which then had this kind of timber shuttering to again, um, encourage ventilation, but provide shading and, um, yeah, provide a kind of comfortable climate, sort of indoor, outdoor, which is totally possible um, in this region of Kenya. You know, not everything needs to be indoors. And the idea was that the corridor could actually be sort of part of the landscape, um, which you see in a lot of hospital designs in, in East Africa. Um, old, often old hospitals um, from the kind of 60s and 70s, often they'll have a kind of, shaded gangway type type thing. Um, so, so here's some elevations, um, elevation from looking at the kind of wood timber shuttering and from, from the back of the classroom, you can see these, you know, we started to develop these kind of bays which line up and then encourage this cross ventilation. So the idea was that the classroom was reorientated um, to the predominant wind direction. Um, and a drawing of um, how, yeah, how, how yeah, I, I think the, the issue we we're trying to figure out in this one was how you'd actually tie these um, gauze panels onto, onto the frame itself um, in, a, in a way that was kind of secure. Um, uh, yeah, so here's, here's some more elevations. Um, and the section through the classroom, 
so what we've drawn here is is a kind of um, quite typical concrete slab um, which was raised. I can't remember the exact amount, but it looks to be around 400 uh, mil from the ground. And then you can see with we're also trying to figure out. I, I, I seem to remember Matt, you said um, we'd asked about class sizes, and we were just trying to figure out if we could get the the right amount of of kids in as well comfortably. Um, an idea here for a kind of storage tank um, and solar panel system, thinking about how to incorporate renewable services. Um, so, you know, yeah, so solar panel technology has come on massively in the last 10 years. Also, the price has dropped significantly, so you can actually kind of reliably power a classroom uh, with solar. Um, and houses and yeah i've worked on house housing projects with um with kind of only solar energy um and also the parts are kind of getting easier to replace even if you live in kind of rural areas so so that's that's a positive um, and and here we've got a kind of uh, rainwater collection tank an idea for a, a sink in the classroom to also encourage you know these these ideas of healthy lifestyles and and um, provide provide water um, in the classroom here. Um, a plan um, showing the kind of a quite a typical classroom layout. You've got the door, double door swing at D1 and these windows and an area for the, the teacher and, and a board and, and the kids. And, and then the idea would be the, the storage would be at the back this kind of consolidated unit. Um, and some drawings of the refixing. Um, Thinking about how you can, yeah, it's always it's always challenging construction when you kind of have two different materials working together. So it's really important to get those joints um, right. But as an architect, you kind of make a step in the in a direction, and then and then you know it gets picked up by other teams. And and um, yeah, I, as with every building project, you know it it also relies on a kind of the guys on site doing a fantastic job. And I think that's something that that you know has really been. Yeah, amazing to see with this project. It's, it's, um, and here's some images we made very early on. Um, yeah, uh, a, a render of a 3D model showing like an example of how how the classroom looked inside. It could look inside, um, uh, and you know, trying to get that impression across of, of the kind of heat and the the kind of spaciousness despite you know it not it's not it's not a huge building it's not a huge footprint because as I said at the start you know your foundations are very expensive part of any construction project and the idea is to keep it small but actually it's a space that we we thought we hoped would work really well um yeah and you kind of got the benefit of a bigger space with having this kind of classroom at uh, this kind of um walkway corridor outside and you actually felt connected to the landscape and like a much bigger space and this is a, an image we made of, of two classrooms together kind of modular um uh construction thinking that okay if you make a second one you can share the wall um in the middle uh and then you can kind of create that that um you know courtyard uh school typology which is which is common in, in Kenya. Um, and, and here are some photos from site. When I saw this, I was just so impressed and excited. Um, I think it's one of the first images I saw and I just thought, yeah, this is fantastic. I, at the time I was living in um, Tanzania, but it was, um, the border was closed because of COVID and I was, I was like <laughs> in distance so close and I could have, you know, in theory, I, I could have driven up, but because of the border closures, it was, yeah, it was very frustrating, was, but I followed, I followed the process and it was really nice to see. And then, um, you know, not just one classroom being built, but then, you know, I, th I think five or six now, and, and it's really exciting to see um, kind of teachers meeting um, in a classroom here. So I, I just wanted to collect these images and sketches to kind of speak about, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the design or the process or the thinking behind it. Yeah, so let's, let's 
Brilliant. Thank you, Hannah, for, for going through that and, um, and, 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 and giving that detail. Really, really appreciate it. I will share some, some more images uh, as well as we're, as we're going on. I think that really, really helps give the background to how the design's gone. Um, I'm hoping, Peter, we've still got you on the line. Peter, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Brilliant, Peter. So, um, tell us from a from a builder's point of view, from a construction point of view, tell us how you felt about these about these builds as well. Tell us how you have found the construction. Have you faced any challenges? Um, how how's how's that going? Ah, uh, from the beginning, it was quite uh, challenging because it was something new. We we have never seen a design of this sort before. In Kenya, we are used to the uh, mason masonry blocks. So when we first saw this design, it was quite captivating. We wanted to, to try something new and uh, following the drawings and everything, uh, we were able to uh, construct it. Uh, I think the biggest challenge in the, this construction period has just been, as Hannah has said, the transportation of uh, materials. Magadi being uh, a remote area, almost 130 kilometers from the main the main town, it has been quite a challenge. And uh, the other thing is uh, water for construction, since it's a very arid place. But with the with the help of the community in gathering the rocks and uh, bringing the rocks to site, we have been able to move the uh, the construction quite fast. And I believe uh, we can actually build more of this and help the community as the classrooms are quite very very. Uh, they cut the they cut the the heat the heat amount by a very big margin. The classrooms are very cool inside, and uh, I feel like this is one of the best innovations that has been done yet. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. I mean, you you've just touched upon the the overall temperature, and and we will open up to to questions in a minute um, for any of us. Um, but temperature. So uh, again, part part of this design, as Hannah's gone through, the intention of the window positions and the, the roof angles, and thinking about the positioning of of, of building, increasing that that flow of air. Um, I was I was in Kenya in June and um, was able to check the temperature. The out uh, the outside temperature was forty two degrees. Um, the inside temperature was 28 degrees, um, so a considerable difference there. Uh, it, it is far cooler, it's a far more comfortable environment um, as, as well. Um, so yeah, um, Barbara has said, what's the cost to build this classroom? Um, so the cost to build the classroom uh, right now based on um, uh, sorry, I'm just doing a quick calculation based on the uh, cost of materials is currently uh, six thousand five hundred pounds UK pounds. So, um, depending on what currency you you you're working in, um, I I I was spending um, about eleven thousand um, pounds several years ago. The last time that we built a a permanent classroom, uh, the, the standard stone built classrooms that are in are in Kenya and the first time that we built this it was five and a half thousand pounds cost of materials has gone up or it will have gone up for standard builds as well um so so yeah um yeah please feel free to keep dropping any messages in the chat any questions that you've got any other immediate questions that anyone's got for Peter and and Hannah uh Will uh hi Matt Hannah and Peter uh, we've discussed before the classrooms. Can you speak to creative living spaces uh, and rooms that could be used as bedrooms? 
Also, what happens if rocks are not available? Can the design be adapted? And finally, could a larger space be created, such as an education centre? Many thanks, Will Travers, co-founder of Born Free. Um, and yes, Tim, Tim's here as well, one of your colleagues, and, and Tim's, I know, has been down um, to see this build. Hannah, do you want to start with, with that? Yeah, um, let me just kind of read here. Um, Can you speak to creative living spaces, spaces, rooms, spaces that uh, bedrooms. rooms that could be used as bedrooms? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, okay, yeah. So so I think for, for me as a kind of um, design approach, I really sort of start with the context um, and thinking about, um, you know, how to, what kind of materials are available and um, what kind of site conditions are there um, and, and using that to kind of inform uh, the, the approach. I think in terms of programming, it's definitely possible to do, to, to build uh, bedrooms like Gabby and wall bedrooms. I think you'd have to consider your kind of building orientation and make sure that, that how your, um, how the how the the building is is laid out kind of promotes a cooler space during the night I think that's definitely possible and if I was to go about that I'd definitely run a, a sort of simulation looking at looking at um heat load um as a as a way to do it I think also going back to the context point I think um I've worked a lot on housing in in sort of hot tropical climates and and often the, the question there is how to cool it as quickly as possible in the in the evening. So thinking about bedrooms um, on the the kind of um, close to the roof, because then you're you're kind of getting some radiant heat during the day, but you're actually losing heat very quickly in the night. So so um, there's a lot of different considerations, but I think it's possible in in um, hot arid climates. I, I don't think I would build big thermal mass um, in in more kind of tropical climates because the, the nighttime temperature doesn't vary as much. So so you're kind of also working with um, with a very constant temperature and it becomes about but but again you can use some principles some of the same principles like um, cross ventilation and these kind of things shading um, to create cool indoor indoor um, climates. Um, I know Will's, Will's added to his question to say he's, yeah. he's specifically thinking ranger posts, uh, which are currently like basically like metal ovens. Hang on, I, I can't read that. Uh, crazy, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, like metal ovens, yeah, yeah. I think, I think then really it, it's how, yeah, I, I guess it's. Are they used during the day or are they used during at night? I'm not. I'm not so sure with the ranger post. Maybe it's a, a whole, um, a whole sort of twenty four seven. They use twenty four hour. I think it are is. They? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's plenty of things you can do. Um, you might also consider actually raising um, slightly the the building off the ground. I mean, especially if you're saying okay. Um, uh, if, if you, I mean, the ground could be a huge heat sink and actually raising, um, raising a building. You see this a lot in kind of vernacular buildings in Southeast Asia. You kind of raise it up and you get this kind of through draft at ground level. And that can be quite interesting in terms of, yeah, keeping cool. And also if you're raising a building slightly above you, you encourage that airflow as well. Um, if it's an area with malaria, if a building's being used at night as well, like um, I think from, from entomology research, mosquitoes are flying in general about a meter and then they kind of track upwards when they hit um, a vertical surface. So it may have also like some benefits, but yeah, I, it's, a, it's a big question. I think it, it's a design uh, challenge as well. Um, so I, I can't answer it in, in a few minutes, but but I think there are some kind of principles from, from this build and from this project that could definitely be kind of applied to different typologies. So Brilliant. And, and, and just, yeah. just one final one on that, Anna. Could could this be a larger space than we've currently got? Thinking an education yeah. centre, so something yeah. something bigger than a classroom. 
Yeah, um, that's an engineering question. Um, I think, uh, yes, I, I think, yeah, it would just require some calculations on the kind of loading. Um, but, but these walls are kind of um, self-supporting. You actually, your kind of structural weight is, is the roof. So being a kind of frame structure and corrugated sheets, it's not a heavy loading. Um, I think the kind of biggest sort of structural challenge we saw was actually wind kind of potentially lifting up. Yeah. So, so wind actually, it, it's sort of working too well and, and this air gap um, starting, so wind actually kind of pushing upwards on the bolts. Um, and that's why we did the study on the, on the roof connections. But yeah, yeah. that's, um, that, yeah, of course, like um, it could be a bigger building. Um, but yeah, I would definitely kind of run those calculations. And I wish Katerina was here as well, because I think I saw the seismic loading question here, and I think she can give a, a more detailed answer there. So I, I, yeah, that's a bit out of my, my field, but um, uh, yeah, Bob, if you wanna kind of discuss that further, um, just pop us a mail, um, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Hannah. Um, there's there's another question in there. Um, how do you do energy and water supply? I think Anna, you've already had sort of identified the options there, haven't you? Water capture and again the positioning of the roof and into potentially into a well uh, as as well and a solar option as well. Um, we are about to progress um, a a build very. Um, very identical but but sort of maximizing those options as well and it's going to be used more as a business center um we were we're going to use the solar energy there as well so um again it's just adapting that and and energy certainly will be solar um there as well yeah. um so there's there's another question hannah it said so i'm in south africa mm -hmm. rocks are a plenty <laughs> and yet people still mostly like corrugated iron shacks. Mm. Would you consider designing a modular stone build that people could build? Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think it's always interesting to kind of look into new projects. I, and I also think the kind of potential of materials is, is so massive. I, you know, one of the um, to go to go to another project. Actually, I've I've worked on recently a housing housing project, and um, we were using kind of a light gauge steel frame and a kind of very thin um, concrete render layer, um, like twenty five mil on each on each wall. And something we were talking a lot about is you know the benefits of actually of not using concrete. I think. Um, across kind of East Africa and and I yeah I, I was in South Africa I've, I've only ever been to Cape Town um, but and there's obviously a lot of historic buildings there but like a lot of the new buildings are, are concrete and I think um, that has a lot of sort of hidden impacts and I you know in terms of sort of sand shortages which you kind of read on the news because obviously you can't use beach sand it has to be a kind of non-salinated sand and that's getting expensive and more scarce um in china right now but also you know i think it it makes a lot of sense to kind of actually think about the embodied energy of the materials you're using and and not kind of um going for the mined materials or the scarce materials or these kind of things but actually trying to work with what you have in your environment makes makes a lot of sense and i think also you know i was talking a little bit about rammed earth as a material we considered very early on in the in the design process and that's extremely interesting that's kind of using you know a kind of wisdom of communities that have lived um in kenya in villages for so many years um, and, and actually kind of building on those kind of vernacular technologies, extremely interesting as well. Um, yeah. And there's a reason that people sort of build in the way they do. Um, and, it, and it's about availability, it's about technology, but it's also about, you know, actually designing with the climate. Um, and that's in, in my research, I'm really, really interested in finding all these ways and, and also like looking across uh, 
kind of, um, uh, what can I say, um, different climate zones in the world for kind of tips and tricks you could actually apply from, let's say, Southeast Asia, which has a very hot tropical climate to Tanzania, which is an extremely similar climate on paper, but actually a very different building tradition. And that can that kind of cross-cultural exchange is, is really interesting as well. So yeah. that didn't answer the question, but, but yeah, I, I mean, it sounds really interesting, the, the South African project. And if there's anyone yeah, yeah. that also want, is interested to collaborate with us, um, yeah, please just just reach out and um, we'd be happy to speak with you. So, I I, I think sort of ex extending into that and probably touching upon where I started. There's another question here that says, are we planning to build our career in other countries? Um, and I think just a, again, as Hannah's said that you know, there's there's only so far that I can go as Mamusi Foundation, and and the idea was never for me to put my arms around this. Um, with in the partnership with Anna and said the only people who can build this is is Mamusa. You know the hope is that that other people take on these concepts that that we can we can again create bigger change in the world um, uh, through through this this approach. Um, and you know specifically for me it was in tackling education. Uh, and again I I will summarise that at the end. Um, so if there are people who are listening to this who say, do you know what, I'm interested, please do reach out to Hannah and I. There's probably, based on the location of where they are, that there's likely to be differences and there's likely to be some changes needed, as Hannah's already identified there. So please do reach out um, and speak to us. Um, Peter, again, hopefully you're still there and your connection's not dropped in Magade. Um, we've got... Um, uh we've got a um a, a question here on construction time are you still there peter yes i'm here okay so in comparison to standard builds is the construction time utilizing this approach is it any different to other builds is it quicker or is it how does it differ um for the normal build using uh, concrete and uh, masonry stone, of course, there's the period of uh, curing and all that. So it, it does cut the construction period by almost half, uh, given that uh, most of it is just ready, ready, readily available material, that being uh, uh, stones. So, yeah, it does make it very quick, actually. It takes a maximum of around three weeks and the class is done. Three weeks to a month and the class is done. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah it's, it is incredibly fast. It's, incre it, it's incredible to see photographs on a daily basis and just quite how fast um, this, process, this process is. So, yeah. Um, Nema has said absolutely we need to collaborate and co-create. Yeah, please do. I'm hoping that there are people on the line um, who, um, uh, who, who, who who wanting to do that. Again, please do do reach out. Um, if there are any more questions, again, please do drop them in in, in the chat. Um, just again, touching upon the point on on education, which you know is 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 again the reason that I started this, just to give people. A little bit more background again as to the rationale of that um, and the research that, that that took into this because the I guess you could look at this and, and perhaps suggest that by building uh, by having the cost of construction we'll just build twice as many classrooms um, that was never the case for me it was more about how education spend not for Mamusi Foundation but for other people how education spend could and budgets could be maintained but to help education to be done properly there were a number of people who i'd spoken to stakeholders in the education space in kenya who were um when i spoke to them about strategy in education spend um it was infrastructure it's built and of course the buildings are important of course construction is important but also my question would be what is the point in a classroom if there is no teacher in the classroom? What is the point in having the classroom if the teacher is unmotivated or the child is too ill or the child is hungry because there are no food or there's no 
th th there's no desks. There's all sorts of challenges that these things bring about for us. So um, what we have demonstrated through a number of pieces of research is uh, we're doing a piece of research on the impact of um, uh, paying teachers the correct salary because again in the areas where we work half of teachers are community paid and therefore not paid properly and therefore are unqualified or unmotivated we've demonstrated a massive impact in grades and attendance through just paying teachers properly um, through work on female hygiene and providing the right training and right materials for girls we've seen absence in schools that we've tried this in that have dropped by 40 percent we've seen through d delivery and support of healthcare that absence again has drastically dropped um, lots of different interventions here in the education space that actually make the school with the building wrapping that so again the whole philosophy here and the whole argument that we've created through this is around maintaining education spend um, and of course maintaining the number of classrooms that are built built but through the saving of money spent in classrooms is to encourage people to do the education spend properly to spend the money inside the classrooms to make sure that the value of that classroom is maximized as well and that's the whole thing that we're trying to create the case for through doing this as well it's one whole big project with the the the, the philosophy of what hannah's created here um, and the built that peter's building here is actually creating cheaper classrooms to do education properly that's creating much cooler learning environments and also reducing the, the whole carbon footprint of construction as well through those use of local materials so um yeah there's a there's a whole philosophy around it um yeah. um i just wanted to add in there that um i think there's also a kind of perception that you know when you when you <laughs> Um, hire an architect and you get a kind of design professional on, on board that you're going to end up with a kind of extremely expensive project um, and something that is going to cost a lot of money to maintain and um, it's going to be a, a bit of a headache but I think this this project sort of goes to show that you know by by working with um, a kind of specialist team and also, also I'm not just talking architect here I'm also talking kind of builder um, you can actually end up saving money and and not only that but you can actually get more quality um, a kind of better quality uh, project so I think it, it sort of um, um, yeah I think I think it's a, also a bit of a flagship for for, um, for yeah the potential of doing that so sorry it's, it's very bright here I, kind of, yeah. I can I can say I can say um, I think there's there's as a couple of people in the chat have said they're going to reach out, which is 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 great. Um, is there any uh, Hannah any final thoughts that you're wanting to share, Peter? Anything that you're wanting to share before we before we close off? And of course, if there are any final questions, please do drop them in the chat, Hannah. Um, yeah, I think from me, um, just a big uh, round of thanks. Um, uh, from me and Katarina, a, thank, a thanks to um, obviously Peter and team um, for their kind of amazing work on site. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to see these classrooms go up and keep the photos coming. And, and I'm hoping to get out there um, next month as well. So it'd be great to meet you in person. Um, and to the Mamusi Foundation, who, um, who we've worked with over the years and you know, this isn't the first project we've, we've worked with, but they've kind of continued to believe in, in, the, in the potential of, of the ideas and the design and, and kind of bring these, bring these uh, drawings to life. So, so I think it's just a big, big thank you to the team and also thanks to everyone that's kind of taken the time out of your day to, to listen to this. And I, I really hope that, you know, um, yeah, if you have any kind of more questions or, um, want to hear more about the project so I'm really happy to to speak about it um so so yeah so just yeah. thanks for me and 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 i again if you are wanting to know more we hannah and i recorded a podcast again uh, a couple of weeks ago so again if you look up mamusi foundation um on uh in in your whoever your podcast provider is there's again there's more conversation from hannah 
Katerina and I as well, just talking about this. So uh, again, if you're more interested, Peter, anything from you? Um, for me, I'd like to say uh, thank you to all for joining the, the meeting. And uh, thank you for everyone for the support. It's been a journey with uh, the Memusi Foundation and with Hana, uh, creating a better place for the community and the children. Uh, we are doing our best to create the best for the kids at site. And uh, please do join us, come visit us, see for yourself uh what we are creating and uh, we hope to work with you more and more into the future brilliant thank you peter thank you everyone for taking the time to join us um really appreciate it um, i hope you have found it informative um and and, and hopefully inspiring as as well and and interesting on the the work that we're doing if you do want to know more again i'll email you a link to the recording of this session um, you should have my email address already. You know where I am. Please do reach out. And again, I'll connect you in with, with Hannah as well. Um, and uh, again, please help us spread the word. Please get the message out there around this um, and, um, and the recording. It would be great, if, again, if we can just keep spreading the message on this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for your kindness on this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Brett.